Sports Bar fan. What I'm going to talk about is advice. Uh, I remember when Chris hit me up and he's like, hey man, you want to talk to San Diego? I'm like, oh, what do you want me to talk about? And he goes, I'll tell you what to talk about. And three weeks ago, he sends me a note and he says, I want you to talk about how to account for advice. And, I'm, and I looked at him kind of like, are you, are you messing with me? <laughs> how many times have we had this conversation? How come out of the get of that discussion? Um, and then we were talking earlier, and I think it's what he's looking for, which is my personal insights and how I manage it. For those who are not aware, I work for a company called Sukuri, as you mentioned. We're a website security company, and five years ago, funny enough, I would have never expected to uh, be where we're at as an organization, right? We have a little bit over 90 employees in 23 different countries, managing close to 50 to 60 million page views a month um, through our network, right? Uh, it's, it's a pretty interesting experience, and through, through the experience, we've learned a lot. Uh, the one thing we've always had, though, is constant advice. Uh, what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing, how we should be doing it. It seems everybody knew how to do it, yet we ourselves, who were running the company, had no idea. Yet, we got to where we were. Uh, and it's not to say that advice is bad, it's not the case. It's just, it's usually out of context. It's usually uh, not in the right perspective, and it's how you manage that. So, in that, I started looking at, as I started preparing for this conversation, I started kind of thinking through like the evolution we've been through. And at the time, my four-year-old daughter was sitting next to me, harassing me. And I was like, when is she gonna grow out of this phase? And it kind of hit me, right? As people, professionals, and I'm gonna focus on the professional business side, and as businesses, we evolve, and we evolve in a very similar pattern, right? Professionally, we're in our infancy, right? And at some point, we're coming into the workforce. We don't know how to engage with people, how to interact, how to say things. Some of us are just natural at it, right? Some of us have been running businesses for a long time, and we've started multiple businesses, but maybe we start in a new environment. And so, our business may be in infant infancy in a specific industry, right? I was in uh, a technology called GIS before I came here to security, so geospatial mapping, things like that. Uh, five years ago, I moved over to uh, website security. Starting in website security, I was in my infancy, right? And so, and starting the business, I was in my infancy. So professionally, I was in my infancy, and as a business, I was in my infancy. And so naturally, there was a lot of insecurities with that, a lot of imposter syndrome. Do I know what I don't know? That guy sounds like he knows what the hell he's talking about, so he must know more than I do. I don't know this shit about marketing or sales. There must be something to it. Everybody else is doing it, right? Look at all these unicorn companies. This is how you hire, right? In my mind, we thought, hey, we think we have an idea of how we want to approach the business. It seems right. It feels right. But everybody else is saying something contrary. Should I be listening to them? And for a while, in our early phases, we struggled with that, we struggled with it a lot. We started looking at how everybody else was doing it, and we started chasing that. And what we learned is that, as long as we're looking at how someone else is doing it, and what someone else is telling us to do, we will never be fully vested in it. It'll never be our journey, and we'll never go in the direction that we need to go as an organization. Because we are on our own journey, we are our unique. It's interesting, if you think about it, if we develop the best, business plan, and we give it to two identical people. We say, hey, here's a business, here's your business plan. Hey, here's the same business, here's a business plan. Why is it that if we know that that business plan succeeds, there's no guarantee that those individuals will succeed? The advice is sound. You should do X, you should do Y, you should do Z. This is how businesses are started in this specific industry. Yet they don't, because every business is a unique organism, okay? And I'll give you a few examples that we've gone to. Who hasn't here heard about this, this idea that you should always increase prices, you're, you're undervaluing yourself? It's very common, and you see it across all articles, all business articles, like you're, you're, you're selling yourself too short, you should be charging yourself more. In the security space, we suffer with that, right? Because in security, when we were trying to bring security to the website, to the everyday consumers, it was coming from a space where it was 10, 20 times what the costs were for the webmaster. It was a completely different market. And so everybody was saying, hey, you should be in these two prices. You're undervalued. It should be this, it should be that. The problem is that that advice was too open. It didn't fully understand what we were trying to achieve as an organization. And the same as you as an organization. What are you trying to achieve? What are you happy with? What are you trying to service? And so for instance, we did end up going through a price change, but this price change didn't happen overnight. This price change, if you would have talked to somebody, you need to price, change your price right now. And you're like, crap, I should change my prices right now. But in reality, this price change happened over five years. And you think you, you ask yourself, God, Tony, this is a lot of lost opportunity. 
Well, not necessarily, right? As an organization, we were not ready for those price changes, right? As an organization, the market that we were in was not ready for that price change, right? Maybe as an organization, we wanted to be at that lower level. And so people say like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it made a lot of sense for us. For us, there was an opportunity for us to grow as a bootstrap organization to get the exposure that we need. Maybe that's you, maybe it's not. So I'm not saying price change is bad, but it's never as simple. Oh, just go and, and multiply by 20%, and you're gonna to go into another market, it's gonna be great, you can hire more people, you can make more money. Well, what people don't understand is when we did the price change, a year ago, to our work we're at in phase three, when we made that price change, we actually dropped signups by 40%. Had we done that three years earlier, we would have never recovered. We would have failed as an organization. And we had to reach really deep for about three weeks for the market to normalize and for us to be introduced into a new market. Right? But when you read these articles, they rarely tell you that story. It's usually completely out of context. Right? We suffer from too much information, and as we learn it, we're like, you'll just naturally know this. But what they don't tell you is like, yeah, it took us five years to get where we're at. This is the journey that we went on. This is the thought process through that. And what I've learned is that when we talk about advice, it's not necessarily the specific advice someone gives you, but more how they got to it. Tell me about your journey. Tell me about the context of that advice. Because sometimes it can be very, very biased. Acquire your audience, right? Invest in marketing, purchase you know, acquisitions, ads, things like that. Um, at the time, we weren't ready for it. It sounds great. It sounds like, yeah, we should be doing that. You're absolutely right. But we had no skills in-house. Most of us were technical. We were working on the server level. We had no idea how to work with ads, how to work with marketing. We didn't even know we were doing marketing. Right? We would write content simply because we wanted to deliver value. We wanted to share information. This is a new malware trend. This is a new attack. We never thought about it in context of marketing. We just thought it was valuable and people would like it. Eventually, one day I was sitting in a bar and someone said, hey, you guys have a great content marketing strategy. I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And they're like, yeah, you guys do great content marketing. I was like, what is that? They're like, oh, the blog articles you put on. I'm like, I came back home and I was like, we have a content marketing strategy. And they're like, what is that? Like, we write articles. I was so happy about that epiphany I had, right? Um, but that, that's just natural, right? We do what we're instinctually willing to do. Some people, there's all these things you can be doing in marketing. For us, what works well is to continue to stay ahead and push out content, and that's who's made us who we are, right? Today, we do acquisition, but we are finally at a size of an organization where we can invest in those things and we can bring the right people in. Don't do the things that we're not comfortable with doing. Just because somebody else said we should be doing that, it may not fit our model. Because it works for someone else doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna work for you. Invest in excellence, and I think everyone here probably understands this. You're talking to somebody who says, you know what you should be doing? You should be doing this. Stop everything you're doing and do this. And then back in your mind, you're thinking, and you, you, you can feel it, you can feel the hairs go up and you're like, man, I just invested like two people on that for six months, and you're telling me to drop that, like for real? And you get very anxious, and, and now you find yourself in a situation where you're like, shit, do I keep doing what I've been doing, which I feel comfortable doing, or do I do what this guy told me to do? And you feel very conflicted. And we've had those instances. We've had those instances where we started to steer away from what made us who we were. And every single time we did what somebody else told us what we should be doing, we slowed down as an organization. Every time we went back to what we were comfortable with and what we were at the root of what you call the flywheel, we would improve as an organization. And so over time, this is what Chris was alluding to, over time, we've become a little bit more resistant to advice. We take the advice, we listen to the advice, and we pull the pieces that are valuable to us. For instance, there's always something you should be doing. And it kind of makes you wonder, how do they always know what we should be working on? You know what I mean? Like, have they taken into consideration every other thing that we have going on as an organization, yet somehow, without any of that context, they're able to come in and prioritize what you should be doing. Doesn't that feel weird to somebody? It feels really weird to me, right? And so when you talk to somebody, somebody just willing to give you that advice without understanding that context, that's usually where I start shutting people off. And I'm like, if you haven't taken any time to understand how it is that I've gotten to where I'm at, or the things that I'm working on, or the things that we've already invested, then your advice will be of no value to you because you really don't care, you just want to push your ideas on top. That's just me.
the thing about advice is that everyone has advice. That's the more PC way of saying it. Same as opinions, right? And as we go through our, our phase, our evolutions, right, in our infancy, you talk to people and you have this great idea, they're like, yeah, 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 that's nice. That's, that's cool, right? Uh, maybe you get a little bit of advice here and then, yeah, yeah, you should invest with this, yeah, yeah, get a contact up, no problem. And as you evolve and you go through the next phase and you're adolescent and kind of young adult phase, depending on where you're at, whether it's large, big, whatever, all of a sudden, everybody's got advice. Everybody's a friend, everybody's got input, everybody wants to give you that shining idea that's going to get you to the next level. Whether they're investors, whether they're boards, whether they're your own employees, right? You bring people in, they look, Two seconds in, and all of a sudden they have input into how everything's messed up. Operationally, we should be doing this, you should be doing that. No context at all on how you got there. And it just gets worse and worse. And as you get bigger, and your organization gets bigger, and you get more awareness, it becomes more challenging. And then at some point, you get to this adulthood where people kind of look at you like, oh, I don't know if I can talk to that guy. That guy's a little abrasive, you know what I mean? You know, um, and then the advice kind of slows down and it's more kind of tuned in, you know, it's more like you're bored and these your peers in other industries and they're like, oh, well, this, this is what you should be doing. Uh, but this, this is kind of like the bell curve as I see the world when it comes to advice. So I want to give you some, some thoughts, and I've already talked to some of them on, on how to specifically manage the advice. First one is filter noise. There's advice everywhere. Every single time you talk to somebody, somebody will have an input into what to do. If you're working on initiative, feel confident in that. Maybe take their ideas and say, okay, no problem. You cannot act on every piece of advice that someone gives you. It's practically impossible. I can probably execute one or two things really, really well. And when you talk to my teams, you'll notice, I always do that to them. They're like, I got this great idea. That is so cool, love the idea. But where are we on this initiative? Oh, no, 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 but this is so much better. Awesome. But I want that initiative. And sometimes you have to reach down and say, you know what, they got a point. It could be better, but I want them to finish that, and I want to see what's going to happen. Don't take it at face value. Too often someone says, raise prices. You're like, I'm going to raise prices today, and your company collapses. Right? Raise prices. Okay, I'll raise prices. But help me understand your journey. How did you raise prices? What were the things that you stumbled on? Why did you raise prices? Can you tell me more about your market? Was there price elasticity in that market? Was it okay? How does that compare to my market? Are we in the same market? Right? I sell puppy food and I sell security. Dogs need to eat. People don't need security into their hat. And I'm not saying that, I'm just saying that's the perspective, right? That's what people think, right? So it's, it's fundamentally different. You're selling something very, very different. So you have to understand what the connecting points are. Listen to people. Listen to people's advice. But pull the pieces that make the most sense for you. Right? Not everything that they offer is of value. Sometimes it might be something completely unrelated to the advice they started with. They start in with, you should be doing X, but before that you had a 15 minute conversation, and in that 15 minute conversation, you had more value and more advice than the actual advice they provided you. You're like, oh shoot, that last point he made was really good. Focus on the context. What are we discussing? How did we even get to this point that you provided me this advice? What do you know about my challenges? Have we had an engaging conversation? Have you asked me the problems that I'm having? Or did you just offer me advice without taking that into consideration? This is an interesting point. The best advice I've ever received and continue to receive is more often advice that comes from people that didn't know they were giving me advice. Have you ever thought about that? You're listening to somebody talk, and then they present an interesting idea, and it's one of 12 ideas, but that one stuck. Maybe in the phase that we were at as individuals, as an organization, we were finally ready for that piece of advice. It finally fit our problems. We finally got to the point where we can apply was being discussed. If you're not ready to apply it, you will just shut it off, naturally. But if you're ready and you're looking for solutions and somebody just briefly mentions it, you will apply it and you will take ownership of that. Don't be afraid to question. Just because someone sounds like they know what they're talking about, just because somebody's always referencing like that guy knows or he has a successful company or whatever, doesn't mean that he's right or she or they. 
right? Ask them. Question their logic. See what they come up with. And remember that you are ultimately responsible. There's a saying, I think Mark Cuban says it from Shark Tank, he goes, uh, never take advice from someone that doesn't have to live with the consequences of it. A bit dire, a bit severe, right? I probably wouldn't go that direction. But there's a good context to that, which is you will live with every decision. It's the easiest thing in the world to give somebody advice. I can sit here and I can talk to every one of you and I will have some advice to give you. I will understand nothing that you're going through, personal, professional, the whole nine yards, but it will be based on my biases. And the other thing, I won't have to live with the decision. If you do it and it succeeds, I'm like, yeah, I give that idea. If you do it and you fail, I'll be like, he executed it wrong. It still works. Right? It's the curse of knowledge. So with that, my name is Tony. This is my thoughts on advice. And if you have any questions, just let me know. But the key here is uh, have confidence in yourself. Right? We don't all get to where we're at without having some level of confidence in what we're doing. And we all suffer from imposter syndrome. We all don't believe that we're heading in the right direction. We all fear the decisions that we're making. We all fear that we're going to do the wrong decision. And so it's very natural for us to look and ask other people or look and see what other people are doing and try to copycat what they're doing thinking that it's us. But it's usually not. Usually, we usually if we make progress, it's usually on us. So that's it. perceive to be smarter people or more successful people and, and, and what you're doing. I mean, I guess the first thing is uh, there really aren't smarter people, right? People are only as smart as we perceive them to be. Just because someone gets up and writes a great article or can get up and deliver a message really well doesn't mean that they're smarter, right? It just means that they're better at delivering some message. Uh, and I think that's the first piece. If we when we start looking and thinking that person is smarter or more successful, we're already putting ourselves down. Right? Um, we have a business for some reason, it, it is working, and your level of knowledge in your market will far exceed what that smart, successful person will have to your specific domain. Um, so I guess that's the first piece to your question. Uh, the second piece is how do you draw the line, and at what point am I being too stubborn, things like that. Um, I think that's a very good question. You can become too stubborn. You can become to a point where, uh, and I've suffered this as well, where you just shut people out so much that uh, you do miss good opportunities. That is likely going to happen. And there is a balance. I haven't quite figured out what that good balance is. Um, usually, what I do is, in those situations, it's about context and discussion, right? If I feel someone is really smart on an idea, I challenge myself to ask engaging questions to understand what that decision was, and then I challenge myself. Um, can we do this? Is it feasible? Is it feasible at this point in where I am professionally and where my organization is at? Just because you have a great idea, if I can't execute it, it won't matter. And this is something I always tell folks. Is you can have as many ideas. My issue isn't ideas. I will share with you anything we have about how the business runs. Because it's not the idea itself, it's how we execute. Right? So if you talk to something, you think someone's really smart and they have good advice, you have to force yourself to listen. And when you engage with them, you have to force yourself to ask the right questions. And then force yourself to regurgitate that information. And say, does that make sense? Am, am I being a jackass here? And there may be instances where the answer is yes, you are, and that's okay. How long were you willing to be that stubborn? We were willing to be five years stubborn with our prices. And it worked out really well for us. Within incremental changes, we worked our way to where we needed to be, to the point that we feel confident. If you take somebody's advice, even if you, if you convince yourself not to be stubborn, if you're not fully bought in and you're not confident in that, you'll never be invested in it, it'll never be your idea. 
The only way you execute is if that idea is yours. So you have to reach that point, regardless of who the person is. Any other questions? The question is, when you're working internally, uh, how do you deal with advice? You're a team leader, you have a team of people you're engaging with, they're coming at you with ideas, how do you manage that? Another very good question, I've dealt with this a lot. So before my time here uh, at Security, I was a defense contractor, and at one point I had about 60 people spread across two different countries, and I was building capital asset systems for the government of Afghanistan. Uh, and it wasn't just about the advice, there was cultural issues, right? Uh, uh, geographical cultural issues. Somebody comes in with this perspective, things like that. Um, and they have certain biases, experiences. What, what has worked in the past, I've gone the route of being very abrasive, where, no, your idea sucks, right? Don't do that, right? That's way too abrasive, and people just don't naturally respond to that. Uh, to evolving more to where I'm at today, which is more along the lines of, love the idea, what are you doing? Right? So all of a sudden, you turn it back around. And one of the things we talk to our teams about, our sales and marketing and business, stuff like that, is if you're going to come to us with an idea, come to us with a solution. How are we going to execute against them? Make them owners of that idea. Because too many people can come up with problems and solutions like, hey, you should be doing this. You know what? I love it. You should update the dashboard. Awesome. Build it. Oh, well, you know, I can't. Great. Guess what? We can't either. You know? And it's not a matter of making them feel stupid. It's just, I, I try to help them understand prioritization. If everything's a priority, then nothing's a priority. And at some point, somebody has to make a decision. It's one of the reasons that I don't necessarily believe in flat organizations, but that's a topic for another day, right? But it's, somebody has to make that decision. So the goal is to help them feel as they're being heard, and then one of the big things that I've been trying to do a lot lately is provide more context. I really like that idea. This is why we can't. Or help them understand the nature of what's happening. This is what's going on in the marketplace. This is what's happening. This is how we're going to approach that. Oh, this is a great idea. Awesome. Well, here's 15. You know what? Give me one. We had a, uh, a company meeting a few weeks back uh, where a dev came in and he had a 50 slide deck. 50, 50 uh, slides and a slide deck of ideas. And every slide deck was an idea. And my partner looks at him and he goes, go ahead, start. And he starts, okay, so we need to improve the dashboard with XYZ and all this stuff. Right? And he goes, great, stop. And he goes, no, 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 I have 49 more slides. He says, no, you don't. You have one more slide and you have 30 days to execute on that. And he goes, just his blank stare. And he says, in 30 days, if you execute against that, we'll have another conversation and we'll go to slide two. Right? We hit the 30 days, now we're going about 45 days. But all of a sudden, they take ownership. And now when they come out with ideas, they're like, Tony, Daniel, Deal with this kind of this, there's a solution to it. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Come, 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 let's talk about it. Right? And are you gonna take ownership of it? Same thing in sales, same thing in marketing. I want to do this initiative. I want to start an educational blog. Awesome. Go start it. Three months later, well, we haven't started the educational blog. Why? What happened? Oh, we haven't had time, there's all this stuff going on. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Got it. Right? So hopefully that can provide some context. And I am done. <laughs>